<laughs> so I'm just hoping that this is a sign of better times ahead of us, where we will all be traveling. Um, so this is going to focus on not the returning traveler who comes back sick, but more on the pre-travel consultation visit. Uh, and as if you were not aware before, we do now have a travel clinic here on Morningside. So this is the overview of the talk. I'll just briefly mention the epidemiology, some general recommendations and touch on uh, the traveler diseases, diarrhea, vector and animal bite prevention, as well as immunization and other travel recommendations. I have nothing to disclose. These are old numbers, but they put things a little bit into perspective. So when we look at travelers' health risk, out of 100,000, you know, 50,000, about half of them will have developed some problems, some serious, some less so serious. And out of those, about one will die. And these numbers actually still hold true because we do have an ongoing monitoring system, which is called the GeoSentinel data. I don't know, you may or may not be familiar with it. This is a, a global sentinel sur surveillance network, which uh, about 54, there may be a, little, a, a, a few more now, uh, globally dispersed physician-based travel and tropical medicine clinics that have been chosen for this ongoing uh, surveillance. And they're based on both the, the places that have training in travel and tro tropical medicine. And when they looked at the data from 2007 to 2011, they found that they found 42,000, a little over 42,000 ill return travelers. And what were they ill with? So GI complaints are very are common, about a third. Um, fevers and then rash. So about 30, 30 and rash a little less. Uh, where do they get ill? Most of them actually get ill in Southeast Asia and, so and Central Asia, followed by Sub-Saharan African. And that possibly more ref reflects more where patients, where, where travelers are going. But when we look at that, on, in, this, in this surveillance data, only 40% of them had had a pre-travel visit. So therefore, overall, even though 20 to 64% of travelers report some illness come, uh, during uh, travel, only, um, only 20 to 80% of travelers seek pre-health uh, consultations. And the group of travelers that is actually the high, at, at a highest risk of developing uh, morbidity during travel I, is what we call travelers visiting their friends and relatives or VFRs. Um, and they have the highest mobility because their perception is that they were born and raised in this country and they can go back. But the truth is that for many of these uh, infections in particular, and you know, malaria is one of them, typhoid is another, they, you lose your protection. With years, you, you do gain some partial protection. Uh, if you live in the, in, in, in the country with ongoing exposure. However, if you're an expatriate and uh, you get out of Africa, for example, you for malaria, you lose that protection in three years. So this is a particular group of concern if they're going back. So always ask, when was the last time you traveled back? So what what Travel consultation is all about is this structured approach, um, and this is from uh, this is from a uh, publication in the New England from 2016. I do recommend it. If there is one paper that you you want to read after this talk, uh, this would be the um, this would be the paper to pull up and read. It's a, it's a very nice and thorough. Um, description of what a pre-travel consultation should be. So what should it be? You have to do a risk assessment, may meaning both the medical history of the traveler, prior experience, itinerary is super important as I will, I, as I will mention, um, talk more about, type of accommodation and so on and so forth. Then you go to the uh, interventions that you should be providing in the office, and that's obviously the immunizations, um, malaria, chemoprophylaxis, if indicated, and then discuss uh, traveler's diarrhea. 
And then there is the focused education before the trip, also depending on, on the type and uh, travel, type of travel and destination. And we'll go over that a little bit. So in some cases, you will focus your discussion more on vector-borne illnesses, in other cases, more on altitude illness and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so what are the medical issues? So there, there is a lot of age-specific issues. And just before COVID, you know, a lot of geriatric population is actually traveling. So you need to be very careful about obtaining a thorough um, past medical history, underlying illnesses, immunosuppression, that all also impacts the uh, vaccines that you may or may not give. Um, you do the regular thing, just like, it's really just like taking an, an h &P with a, a little with a little uh, special focus on vaccine and what underlying condition will affect your ability to vaccinate or not vaccinate it's more of a review to find out what's contraindicated uh, and just to mention a few things that we do need to keep in mind so allergies um, what vaccines can you use? Well, if you're allergic to eggs, you can uh, you should use the yellow fever vaccine with caution. And some, and I and emphasize, some of the flu vaccine um, were raised in an egg-based uh, media, not all of them. So you should know what your which vaccine does this clinic have. Always think about, and this is now very. Uh, <laughs> this has come up again and again and again with the. Um, the mRNA COVID vaccines, what other excipients are in vaccines? You don't have to know this, you don't have to learn it. Um, just check this immunofacts. It's a very thorough list of anything that is or is not included in a vaccine and what should be avoided. And yeah, and then medications. Again, medications and allergies. If a, pay, if a traveler is allergic to sulfa, for example, you should stay away from acetazolamide, which um, is diamox, which is used for high altitude sickness, and you should stay away from Fancidar. Um, always, always, always check about um, antibiotic al allergies, particularly quinolones, because that's what we tend to use for the diarrhea. And then chrysanthemums. I've never actually met a person who's allergic to chrysanthemums, and but there is a cross allergy between that and permethrin. Then you look at you look into interactions. You look into drug disease interactions. Keep in mind that PPIs or H2 blockers can can theoretically increase the risk of developing tra travelers' diarrhea. Um, and I always point this out because I have seen minocycline used for, for malaria. It lacks a proven uh, protection for malaria. Don't use it. And then there's a drug drug interactions. This is nothing new to you guys. Antimicrobials can interfere with them. Um, um, so the PO typhoid is a live vaccine and typhoid is a, is a salmonella species. So if a patient is on antibiotics, they should they cannot take they should not be taking it with the typhoid. It will prevent the efficacy of the vaccine. Uh, bismuth subsalicylates can bind quinolones. Uh, that's another thing to to let patients know. And obviously, warfarin and any antibiotics can increase the anticoagulant coagulant effect, which can be important in your elderly patients traveling. I just listed a few of the precautions. Um, you know, mefloquine now has a black box warning actually because of its psych effects, not just uh, depression, but also hallucination and other neuropsychiatric um, complications. So, really, it should be avoided in travelers that have an underlying, um, underlying depression or, or, in fact, any other psych problems. Uh, BPH and scopolamine. The scopolamine can um, is a strong anticholinergic agent. Obviously, it's meant to for 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 no, um, that's what what its use is for. But it can uh, augment urinary retention in patients with BPH. Something to keep in mind too. 
A few more of them of these, a lot of patients with ulcerative colitis, if they develop traveler's diarrhea, it can trigger a bad bout of UC. And um, just to point out, they are not more likely to develop traveler's diarrhea, but they're more likely to have severe uh, complications from the diarrhea. And pre-existing liver disease is an indication to vaccinate against hepatitis A and B. And in fact, we do recommend it unless patients don't want it, to that all travel to all countries, at least for hepatitis, should be vaccinated for hepatitis A because believe it or not, there are ongoing food outbreaks with Hep A all over the world. Uh, COPD and high altitude, that's, that's something that keeps coming in and out. Um, it's probably a, a risk for worse um, of developing high altitude. However, anybody healthy, young and old, anybody can develop high altitude uh, sickness. So travel preparation, what do we talk about and what do we recommend? Well, we always talk about the travel health insurance, both for medical care, hospitalization, and most importantly for certain travelers, the going into, into areas with, into rural areas for a prolonged time, the evacuation plan. It's really, a, a, we just, we don't recommend any one kind of insurance. We, we just let people um, be aware that there is something called a travel insurance. And particularly if, as I said, for, for certain kinds of travel, we recommend that. Uh, be aware of how to obtain a medical care abroad. Um, look into where, if I do get sick, where do I get seen? Uh, and awareness of travel notices. And I'll show you where, where it's the cdc.gov um, Web page, which is actually the best for these travel notices, and I'll give you an example of it at the end of this talk. We always talk about hand hand washing and hygiene. Well, now COVID has sort of ingrained this <laughs> pure hand sanitizers use into all of us, so it's probably less of an issue to talk about. But pre-COVID, we always recommended people take that with them, especially on plane during travel, and also depending on where they are. Check airline regulations. And this is applicable today all, um, again, because with COVID, every airline seems to have a different, um, different recommendation and different requirements actually. So, you know, make people aware of that, that they need to check those beforehand. And we also do urge people to have their uh, PPD placed. Uh, this is just a list from from the from the yellow book actually of what a travel emergency kit should have. I'm not going to go over this. This can uh, it's pretty um, straightforward, and anybody can adjust this travel kit uh, to their own personal needs yeah. and make sure that they have the medications with them and so on and so forth. So what are the infectious disease risks to the traveler? Again, it's going to depend on where they're going, what kind of travel, but this is just a list, list of them. And it's by far not, the, there's, there's a lot more, but these are the most common ones. And this is a, um, just a table. It's, it's from up to date, actually. It's either from up to date or from the New England uh, journal i should have put the reference i'll add it um but it's very what you are at risk of being exposed to depends on the geographic area that you're going to and um this is a nice table because in the first column here it will give you literally just caribbean uh, central america south america south central asia and so on and so forth and which tropical diseases uh, are you at risk of getting it's a little easier for all of us uh, because many of these are mosquito borne like chikungunya, dengue, malaria, Zika. Um, but know that, for example, dengue and chikungunya, that those two conditions are very are sometimes difficult to differentiate, um, except that chikungunya has more of a joint involvement, as, whereas dengue more of a fever and headache involvement. 
but know that you will find that in Central America, but you will also be there, you will also find leptospirosis, histo, coccyx, and leishmaniasis, which causes Chagas disease, is a big problem in Central America, both in Peru and, and, and that's the, uh, you know, you can get that not just by, from the flies, from the feces of the flies, but also from, from some foods, because if a food is left out in the open, these flies can leave the organism in food. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're going to South America, again, they're pretty similar. Uh, Zika, as you remember a few years ago, was a big problem. Uh, South Central Asia, dengue is a big problem. Again, enteric fever, malaria. Um, it's primarily non falciparum. I will go over that a little more and so on and so forth. Just look it up. Once you know where your traveler is going, just look up, make sure you're not missing any of these. So malaria. Malaria is a, is a big, big problem. In fact, it's the fifth cause of death from an infectious disease worldwide after respiratory infection, HIV AIDS, diarrheal diseases, and tuberculosis. So this is a big problem. Um, in uh, 2019, there were 229 million cases and 409,000 deaths. That's a, that's a, it's, it's a huge mor morbidity in certain parts of the world. And which countries are you most likely to develop malaria? So there are about 35 countries, uh, in, most of them in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Asia. And they account for the big ma majority or almost 98% of global malaria deaths. Now that does not mean that uh, acquiring malaria. You can, you're very likely to acquire malaria also in some parts of uh, South America. But the deaths are mostly in these, uh, in, in these areas. Obviously, it's a, you get it from a mosquito bite. There are mu multiple, uh, there are mostly four, there are about five types now. Falciparum and Vivax is the most common. Um, and of those five types, it's the Vivax and Ovali that can stay dormant in liver. And that you, so that's important because the treatment option is a little different, even though we're not going to talk about that. You need to add a, an agent like primaquine to that, uh, that gets rid of the liver hypnozoids um, if a patient comes back with malaria. Uh, falciparum is the deadly one. Uh, it can result in recrudescence when parasites are incompletely eliminated and infection re can actually recur weeks to months later. Um, so that can be a tricky one uh, of the malaria types. So where is malaria? If you look at the world, um, red parts of the world are, is ma where malaria occurs throughout so you can get malaria there whenever you go there, and it's uh, uh, it's ongoing. Uh, in the yellow areas, mostly here in Asia and in in Brazil and some parts of South Africa, South um, America, malaria trans transmission occurs in only in some parts. And how do you know which parts? Well, that's where you go to the interactive. Um, interactive pages on, on, on the CDC web page or the yellow book, it will give you a very detailed list of where you, um, where you will find malaria and where not. For example, in Thailand, it's really just by the borders. It's not by the, it's, you, there's no malaria in the, uh, the, 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 the islands, which are such a, um, which a lot of the tourists go to. So look it up. Uh, and, and treat accordingly. Now, we always need to keep in mind um, resistance. So falciparum, let me start by, 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 by saying the following. The chloroquine, the only areas of the world that are left with chloroquine sensitive falciparum are these blue areas. So Central America and the Arabic Peninsula and Egypt too. So that's the easiest thing to remember. This is a, this is a new phenomenon. Now that they, we stopped using chloroquine for so many years because of resistance, there are some sensitive areas popping back up 
but for now the safest thing for you to know is that the the arabic peninsula and central america those are the only areas left with chloroquine sensitive falciparum the black area is an area of note so this is vietnam laos um, cambodia and parts of of burma or the border of burma and thailand that's an area where they have actually mefloquine resistant falciparum so you can't use mefloquine so any patient going to areas within for example cambodia like angkor wat is a very um, uh, common destination they should not be given mefloquine and then the red areas is is malarious areas where you have uh, a resist of, uh, uh, chloroquine resistance, but not necessarily mefloquine resistance. And as you can see, most of the areas in the world with have chloroquine resistant falciparum. This is just a table, um, not meant to be read. It's, but this is the this is the chemo prophylaxis treatment for uh, against malaria. So one now that you know where the patient is going. And now that you know whether whether or not there is a risk of of getting malaria, now you can decide is that is that destination uh, a chloroquine resistant or b chloroquine sensitive. So the if it's um, resistant, you can use malarone, mefloquine, doxy, or tafenoquine. So the difference between these and how you choose them is one, the duration of treatment after you come back. Uh, malarone, is the, malarone and tafenoquine are the shortest. And the other thing that you try to decide is, do you want to take a weekly tablet or do you want to take a daily tablet? Which is easier? Which, which will you remember? And I've heard it all. Some people say I'm much, I'm much more likely to remember the daily one than the weekly one and vice versa. Um, the problem I mentioned it before the mefloquine has a problem with with psychiatric side effects and, and hallucinations uh, doxy is a problem when you're going on a vacation because you, it makes your skin sensitive to sun and um, you need to be very clear about that because it really does make people get sunburns and it can be tough on the stomach it has a lot of GI side effects um, tafenoquine, remember you need to check G6PD status, just like with primaquine. Tafenoquine, you need to check that before. Sensitive, obviously, the only added agent to that is the chloroquine that can use, and, and that is a weekly medication. So again, just to be clear, you need the full itinerary for all of these reasons. Um, you even need to know the stopovers because there are some countries, for example, that will um, that for yellow fever they will require yellow fever. They may or may not require yellow fever at the final destination, but even if you are have a stopover, even without deplaning, if you just stop, if the plane just stops for a fuel fuel or something, in a country where yellow fever is endemic, they may require you to have the yellow fever. Um, vaccination at, at the end stop. So that's important. Styles of travel, accommodation, where are you sleeping? Are you sleeping in a hotel with uh, air conditioning and, and no mosquitoes or are you out there camping? And then activities, what kind of activities are you, uh, will you be engaging in? So these are the three R's of immunizations that we're now gonna move on to. It's the routine ones, it's the required ones and recommended. And the routine are just the whatever routine like vaccines that we do anyway. The required ones that mostly applies to yellow fever because the WHO does require yellow fever vaccination for, for certain countries. And I'll show you a map of that. And then there's a recommended one where patients can um, decline them, but that, that will depend on the geographic destination, activities and, and underlying health. So what are the routine ones? Um, I don't really need to go over this. This is all that you know. You already all know all of this. For travel specific and Tdap, remember that the pertussis part of Tdap is an important one. And adults who only got their childhood T TDA 
uh, that you should strongly recommend a single dose of Tdap. Now for travel, we recommend Tdap vaccination every five years, even though it's already 10 years here. Influenza, nothing particular there. We always recommend it. Um, and make sure you have the updated routine vaccines in older people. MMRs, what's so special about MMR for travel? Well, the problem is uh, any traveler that's born in the US after 1956, um, he should either have, you sh they should either show you a documentation of two doses or evidence of immunity. And this two do dose business is, is uh, problematic because many persons that were born in the US before 97, they would never receive the vaccine. However, they're likely immune because they um, were exposed to it, measles. Um, per persons born in the 70s have not had a second dose because that recommendation was only out there in 1990. So you have to be pretty uh, accurate about vaccinations. And then there are all of these other um, vaccines that can, can should be recommended depending on where they're going. Uh, as I mentioned before, Hep A really should be a travel vaccine for everyone, any going anywhere. Um, and Japanese encephalitis is only in the rice paddies in Japan and Southeast Asia. And that's very seasonal. So you have to look up the, the season also. Uh, meningococcal vaccine, the, um, nothing, nothing special for, for travel except that Africa does have this meningococcal belt that we call, and anybody going to this belt should get the, um, the meningitis vaccine. And these are the yellow fever endemic zones. Most of these countries uh, have a requirement for yellow fever vaccination documentation. Uh, but remember, the, the, it's not just the final destination, it's where the, 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 the whole trip matters. This is a list that you should know because now we are using, there's more and more immunosuppressed patients out there, not just from transplant, but all of these rheumatologic patients on monoclonal antibodies, they are all at risk for, for, for different infections. So you should know which are the live vaccines which can cause harm. It's the intranasal flu vaccine. It's the oral polio, not the IM polio. MMR, obviously, varicella, and the oral typhoid and the yellow typhoid. Well, the oral polio, polio is not really available in this country, so you don't have to worry about that one. Traveler's diarrhea has a multiple, has a lot of names depending on where people get sick. Um, it's literally it's over three unformed stools a day. But if it's associated with nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, or low grade fever, you should treat. And we often, and most of the times, we give patients uh, a, a course of antibiotics. It's uh, Cipro, except for Southeast Asia, you can no longer use Cipro. You need to use azithromycin for that. And that's because of, um, that's because of resistance. In most cases, it's three, it's self-limiting. And this is just another classification. If you have diarrhea for three days with the symptoms, you should consider self-treating and so on and so forth. If not, you should advise patients not to take the antibiotics. This is just a list of who needs a further workup. So if anybody who has um, bloody or mucous stools with cramping, a stool culture should be done because Campylobacter and Shigella are treated differently. And patients um, with upper GI symptoms like bloating, nausea, um, that's, that's a reasonable um, reason to, uh, to have their stools examined for Giardia, Cyclospora, and Isospora. Um, this is just a, a little bit of the same. It's pretty much your common sense. If they're ill, they should be taken to the hospital. So what about food recommendation? Bottom line is boil it, peel it, cook it, or forget it. So that's the bottom line. So that means you should eat well-cooked meat, vegetables, and other foods. Um, freshly boiled foods that are served hot also are safe. 
spreads obviously nuts if you can peel it and canned food so what's not okay to eat and what pay, travelers should avoid is uncooked food unpasteurized dairy products salsas because that stands uh, and anything that's out in the open for a prolonged time water precautions bottom line boiled water do not you know be careful that the seal is intact on bottled water because they have been known to refill it with tap water which in many parts of the world is just not safe i uh, should avoid ice cubes also because freezing water does not necessarily kill the organisms and diarrhea treatment as i mentioned before we use the quinolones for three days except for southeast asia you use azithromycin this is just a slide to remind you that there's a lot of bloodborne and std precautions that can happen during travel and depending on the traveler and the nature of the travel you should discuss that or um, with certain kinds of travelers for example healthcare workers going to africa to do surgery we often re recommend they take uh, hiv prep with them um, and so on and so forth so it's very dependent on where you're going and, and what you're doing um, and then for for example for um you know Vector precautions, that's very, very important because as I mentioned before from the table, uh, most of these are mosquito or even tick-borne. So covering your skin is important. In insect repellent with at least 28% DEET is what works the best. And then we do recommend people um, treat their outer clothes with permethrin. Permethrin kills ticks on contact and is a very good mosquito repellent. Um, it's either as a kit for your washing machine, it's as a spray, and some of the sports stores also sell these clothes pre-treated. Um, you should use insect, insect screen and that all, you know, depend, depending on where you're sleeping and so on and so forth. Uh, insecticides for indoors, insecticides for outdoors, and then inspection of skin for ticks. These are just some of the environmental precautions that we do mention, again, depending on where you're going. Uh, patients that are going to hike the Kilimanjaro, they should, you know, they should have some Diamox or Acetazolamide with them. Um, sun protection is an obvious one. Uh, altitude, so high altitude, I mentioned that already. And then water recreation. Um, there are a lot of accidents that can happen, and schist and leptospirosis is a, is a risk there. Animal precautions, so rabies vaccine, we only recommend that these days for uh, if you're going for a prolonged time in, in areas like aid workers, in areas where there is no help, no very few medical facilities, and, and um, and you're going to be working directly with wild animals. Um, so we're also mentioned, you know, it's always worth mentioning that patients that are coming back, they, it's, it's reasonable to have a post-travel checkup, particularly if you're going to places like India and um, areas with, where, um, where, um, Tuberculosis is prevalent, so just mention that. And then post-travel care is always important. Injury and crime, again, that, that can or cannot be a discussion depending on the kind of travel and traveler. And I will finish off with these resources here. If you are advising a traveler, go to the cdc.gov travel for the malaria areas. Uh, the WHO also has a very nice, um, nice uh, web page with good resources, and then the State Departments have have their own. International Society of Travel Medicine, that's where you have, get the nitty gritty, and then the Yellow Book is a very good, good handy resource, very easy to look up. So the, I would say that the Yellow Book, along with the CDC web page, are probably the easiest. And this is why I like the CDC to go, go, go and this I just took a picture of it yesterday. Um, it gives you a warning 
uh, it gives you areas of warning. For example, if it's in the red here, you should know about this. So here, these are countries that have things happening that you shouldn't go be going there. For example, now in Haiti, the 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 earthquake that that was there recently has made their drinking water um, with that has resulted in limited access to electricity, drinking water, and even food supply. So, you know, unless you unnecessary travel should not should not happen. Same applies for Venezuela. The infrastructure there is just not it's just not stable. And then there are these volcanic eruptions in um, in these areas that you see there, but also in um, in in the Canary Island in Spain this week. I'm surprised they didn't add that yet because I don't know if you saw it. It's crazy. It's wiping out the whole city there. So this is a why it's always good before a travel clinic. Just check the CDC. Let let's see what's going on because sometimes things happen you may or may not have seen it in the news. And then there are the other alert levels, which for me is very useful because polio for one, they keep changing the recommendation for polio vaccines, especially in, in African countries. So it's always good to get your real updates there. And that's it. I don't even know. Yeah. Thank you so much.